Japan's nuclear crisis raises alarms worldwide and brings the U.S. nuclear industry under intense scrutiny. What can we learn from a once unimaginable catastrophe? Each time these kinds of events happen, I think it's very important for us to examine uh, how we can further improve uh, the safety uh, and performance of these plants. How safe are our reactors and the people living around them? It's not fun living in the shadow of a nuclear power plant. Energy now goes to America's potential danger zones. Power plants near seismic fault lines, aging reactors, is nuclear just too dangerous? And should it remain part of our energy future? And could this be the next generation of nuclear? Modular reactors in your backyard or underwater, smaller and maybe a whole lot safer. This is Energy Now. The Japanese earthquake and tsunami, devastation, fear, and a nuclear emergency, bringing with it mounting concern about the safety of nuclear energy. Hello, I'm Thalia Shuris. Welcome to Energy Now, a weekly look at America's energy challenges and what we're doing about them. And one thing the country had been getting behind was nuclear and its promise of an energy-rich future without carbon emissions. But the Japanese crisis has thrown the future of nuclear up in the air. Japan suffered a rare but catastrophic act of Mother Nature, compounded by aging facilities. America gets 20% of its electricity from nuclear power, but how do our plants measure up? A map of seismic faults here in the U.S., the most dangerous in red, others in orange and yellow, and the least threatening here in green, shows that most of the 104 active nuclear power plants are inside or near quake zones. So what are the odds an earthquake could damage the core of one of our reactors, exposing the public to radiation? One in 74,000. That's what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission told MSNBC.com. That is 10 times more likely than your winning $10,000 in the Powerball lottery. And as always, there's the potential for human error, which is what happened in America's worst nuclear accident ever at Three Mile Island in 1979. While these are daunting questions for all of us, Americans living near nuclear facilities are especially concerned. What can their nearby reactors withstand and are preparations in place for a worst case scenario like Japan had? Energy Now Chief Correspondent Tyler Suters takes a look across America's nuclear power zones for answers in this Energy Now Spotlight. This is my certificate for teaching boiling water reactor technology with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Dave Lockbaum has spent three decades in the nuclear industry, but he's far from an advocate. I met him at his home office, where he now pushes for more stringent nuclear safety. The reason I work for the Union of Concerned Scientists is 18 years ago, a colleague and I raised issues with how spent fuel pools were stored at these type of plants. Concerns Lockbaum noticed while working at three different U.S. nuclear plants that have the very same reactor design as the crippled plant in Japan. This is the same GE reactor design that's in place in Fukushima, correct? Yes, both of these, both the Hatch plant and the Browns Ferry plant are GE designs, BWRs with Mark I containers. Lockbaum says the nuclear industry ignored his warnings and others about the reactor design. So he took them to Congress. Then, about 15 years ago, he put them into print. He says his concerns about reactor safety have now been proven. So you actually wrote a book about the exact crisis that Japan's dealing with right now. Very similar. Had, had this problem been solved, the plant in Japan still would have had a problem, but it wouldn't have been as severe as it is right now. Anytime there's a nuclear event of any kind, people's anxiety will uh, rise. Dale Klein was chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for part of the time Lockbaum was there. I think as they get more educated on what really happened, then it will reach back to a steady state and they will look at nuclear energy in its proper perspective. From Ann Harris's perspective, there have been problems for decades. She spent 16 years working for the Tennessee Valley Authority, owner of the Watts Bar plant you see behind us. What does it make you think of? It makes me think of death. Harris was so upset by what she saw at TVA that she became a whistleblower. She's now a community leader among Tennesseans living near the state's two nuclear plants. Will it scare them? Uh, a lot of them. For the better? Uh, probably, because this is uh, the most vivid educational um, activity that I've seen on this industry since I've been in it. 
The lesson is even more vivid in California. That state also has two nuclear plants, including Diablo Canyon, both of them near the Pacific Ocean, both of them near major fault lines. I'm nervous about it. I haven't really thought about it in a long time because nobody talks about it anymore. Um, I have a lot of friends that work there, and it, it seems like, you know, they run a pretty tight ship. An NRC study of reactor risk in seismic zones concluded that operating nuclear power plants are safe, but that despite small risks, some reactors warrant further attention. I think the American public should have confidence that the nuclear plants in the United States have to withstand the design requirements for earthquakes and in the case of those on the California coast also have to withstand a tsunami. But Lockbaum says we might not even be as prepared as the Japanese. In our plants, we have, most of our plants, have four hours worth of battery to back up that situation. Mm -hmm. Japan had eight hours. And they weren't able, they played beat the clock and lost. It still wasn't enough. Nuclear plants are designed to withstand uh, certain levels of, uh, of uh, uh, earthquakes. But having said that, nothing's completely uh, fail safe, nothing's completely uh, foolproof. That includes our planning. Evacuation routes are another growing concern among locals. It's not fun living in the shadow of a nuclear power plant. The Diablo Canyon plant in California casts that shadow on Elizabeth Apfelberg. She's with the anti-nuclear group Mothers for Peace. This one road that goes in and out of the Diablo area. And there have been times when there's been accidents on that road and it ties it up completely. As a former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I can assure you that the NRC will examine this in detail. They will look to see if they need to change any procedures. About 30 years after Dave Lockbaum entered the nuclear field, he sees a more pressing danger. U.S. nuclear plants, like the engineers who designed and launched them, are getting older. Is time a bigger factor than natural disaster and the erosion or the problems that could arise from our nuclear plants? Yeah, wear and tear is, is a bigger threat than natural effects because wear and tear affects every plant. And one of those plants, Sequoia, sits about 10 miles from Dave Lockbaum's home. Just because the risk is elevated doesn't mean that you guarantee bad things. But when you're faced with that situation, what you want is a very aggressive regulator to make sure that there's no safety shortcuts going on. We don't have that effective regulator. In Tennessee, Tyler Suters, Energy Now. So what happens when the unimaginable becomes reality? The Japanese thought they could handle every conceivable threat to their nuclear plants. They were wrong. How confident are we in the ability of our nuclear facilities to withstand numerous potentially dangerous scenarios? After all, 23 of our 104 nuclear power reactors are of similar design and age as the troubled Japanese reactors. Here to talk to us about those scenarios is Jared Adams from Arriva, a company that builds nuclear facilities all over the world, including Japan. And welcome. I just would like to take a moment, and I know you'll join me in this, to say that our hearts certainly go out to the people in Japan during this time of crisis and tragedy. And let's talk about the situation here. What we've been hearing is that uh, people in this country are worried about oversight of the nuclear reactors. In fact, are they safe? Uh, do you have confidence in the oversight? Um, in the United States, we have a very active regulator. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, oversees America's nuclear reactors very carefully and constantly trains and, and ensures that our reactors are, are prepared for a variety of natural disasters. But are we in a time period in which natural disasters go hand in hand with the amount of risk that we're willing to take to run nuclear reactors? Well, it's, it's difficult to predict the futures completely, but we can, we can do whatever we can. And, and we'll take the experience from, from this situation and from other ex situations and learn from it and incorporate those into our operations to ensure that we can operate our plants as safely as possible. Well, what can we learn from France? 80% of its energy nuclear, it comes from nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Large level of vulnerability then. What can France teach us? Your company is French. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things the French did is they, they minimized the number of different reactor types. Um, they only have a few different reactor models so that if there's ever an issue with one reactor, they can apply that same solution to, a, to the whole fleet. In the United States, we have quite a few different reactors, but we still have taken a lot of, a lot of the lessons and shared them across the industry. But, so. but is this time, though, as some legislators have said, to put on the brakes 
on licenses, new licensing in this country until this is all reviewed? I think we could still take this experience and, and build into to what we're doing now. Uh, and, and I think the licensing process allows us to, to, to build in the experience from what we learn from this experience and, and still move forward. But what can be done here in the United States now? Well, today we have, we have the ability to, to withstand, as I mentioned, a variety of, of natural disasters operating challenges that, that puts us in a very strong situation to do, be able to deal with a variety of crises. And I know that as we follow up from this experience that, that the government and the, and the regulatory authorities are going to work with the industry and vice versa to be able to implement the lessons that we take away from this event. Okay, Jared Adams, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, not everyone is so secure in our security. I spoke with Peter Bradford, a former nuclear regulatory commissioner who is now skeptical about nuclear safety, and Arnie Gunderson, a nuclear engineer on the Vermont Governor's Oversight Committee for the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant. Here's what they had to say in this week's edition of The Mix. Let's talk about the situation here in the United States. The Energy Secretary made a comment uh, this week. I'd like us to listen to it and get your reaction. And the American people should have full confidence that the United States has rigorous safety regulations in place to ensure that our nuclear power is generated safely and responsibly. The administration is committed to learning from Japan's experience as we work to continue and strengthen America's nuclear industry. Can the American people have full confidence in the safety, as the Secretary says? You know, uh, on one level, of course, it's true that uh, these are unlikely events, and they're even more unlikely to be replicated anytime soon in the U.S., but the underlying problem of nuclear licensing is that some events get deemed to be impossible, and therefore they're not designed against, trained against. That was indeed a rare catastrophic event. Can you protect against that ever, Mr. Gunderson? I, I think we need to amp up the, um, the, the criteria with which we judge these events. We need to look at tsunamis on the west coast, earthquakes on the west coast, uh, Mississippi floods in the middle of the country. Um, we really need to relook at that issue of what really is the worst Mother Nature can throw at us. We, we determined that the New England earthquake, if Vermont Yankee, for instance, were, were evaluated, or any of these 23 old plants, were evaluated to just modern earthquake standards. We're not talking about a new earthquake, but the way now we understand earthquakes to, uh, to exist, it wouldn't pass muster. These, these plants were, were designed 40 years ago with guys on slide rules, um, and uh, the analysis has become much more robust. Japan's backup diesel generators, then its backup batteries also failed. They're both overwhelmed. Their batteries have uh, an eight hour life. Ours have sometimes as low as four. Should our standards not be stricter to reach that level? Well, you know, the question we don't know the answer to in that context is whether they were all overwhelmed by a single event. They might have had eight backup systems, but if they were all vulnerable to the tsunami, uh, then it's as though they only had one. Well, let me go back to Mr. Gunderson, shutting down or, or at least slowing down what's happening in the industry. Would that be acceptable? Slow you know, down, take a harder look. I think we need to take a harder look at the ones that are operating now. Um, and I think we're going to find... Um, the cost to backfit some of these really old plants, you know, like Oyster Creek in New Jersey, it's built in 1969, Vermont 72. Um, the cost to backfit these may cause the owners to shut them down. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did shut down all of the plants of the Three Mile Island type design within a couple of weeks of that accident for a period of three or four months in order to be sure that uh, they were satisfied that, that they, they didn't have a similar vulnerability. So that is within the power and within the possibility of, of the regulators to do. It's just too early to know whether that is the right response. But here's the key. The 20 percent of this country's electricity comes from nuclear power. Should that number go up? If it were up to me, this is not the time to be talking mm -hmm. about uh, building more nuclear plants. They're too expensive anyway. Uh, the nuclear renaissance was a shambles even before this accident because of the high cost. So it will take uh, federal loan guarantees, putting the customers on the hook. And it's very hard for me to imagine that the average American sitting in front of their television set 
uh, since this accident began, that these families are turning to each other and saying, I'd like to put our savings into building the next round of, of nuclear plants right now, dear. Many, many reviews ahead and many questions still. Thanks to both of you gentlemen for joining us. Thank you. Th thank you. The 1 2 earthquake tsunami punch to nuclear plants in northern Japan has scientists and governments scrambling to understand what happened and what lessons can be learned. It has also renewed scrutiny of America's resurging nuclear industry. What will the government do? What should it do? We'll hear from one congresswoman with very strong views on nuclear energy. Plus, could the future of nuclear be getting smaller? We'll show you one idea that puts the power of nuclear right in your backyard. You know, girls, I used to cheer back in my day. Ready? Okay! Go team! That was amazing. 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 Mom! That was amazing. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of siblings in foster care who'll take you just as you are. Welcome back to Energy Now. We're taking a close look at the future of nuclear energy in the U.S. following the Japanese nuclear crisis. Is nuclear energy safe? And is the government prepared to handle a natural disaster like the one we've seen in Japan? Joining me now for more is Republican Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee. She also sits on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Her state is home to three working nuclear reactors and is also home to the only nuclear reactor currently under construction in the United States. So, Congresswoman, welcome. Thank you. You have all those reactors in your state. Can you guarantee to your constituents, that those living near those reactors, that they are safe? We certainly know that uh, TVA, who has the nuclear reactors, has worked with the NRC. They have plans in place. They have been very diligent in making certain that these reactors are safe. Is there ever any real guarantee, though, the Japanese believe that they were ready pretty much for anything, the 7.9 earthquake, right. the 30-foot tsunami, <clears throat> and those numbers were exceeded? Is there a level of risk that's acceptable to you? I, I think there is always that risk. And, you know, in Tennessee, we have a great example last year we had a flood that was a thousand year flood and has caused extensive damage. It exceeded any of the plans that were there based off the hundred plus flood expectations and flood plans. What we have to do is make certain that and go back in and review all of these emergency preparedness, emergency response. Senator Lieberman uh, earlier said that there should be breaks put on the process. Let's listen to what he said sure. and then we can talk about sure. it. The reality is that uh, we're watching uh, something unfold and we don't know where it's going with regard to the nuclear power plants <clears throat> in Japan right now and I think it calls on us here in the U.S. naturally not to stop building nuclear power plants but to put the brakes on right now until we understand uh, the ramifications of what's happened in Japan. He said not stop, not a moratorium, but put the brakes on. Do you agree? I think what we have to do is to step back and look for the lessons learned in Japan and do some review. The Energy Committee chairman, your, your chairman, uh, has called, uh, has been asked for some, to hold some hearings. Uh, right. A letter was sent to him by uh, Democrats and they said the worsening nuclear crisis in Japan is raising serious questions in the minds of many Americans about the safety and preparedness of nuclear power plants in the United States. They're saying serious questions, you're saying review. Is it the same thing or should there be hearings? I, I think you will see us do hearings. My expectation would be that Chairman Upton and Chairman Whitfield would seek to move forward with some hearings and uh, review what we have learned. We will certainly be looking at some of the regulations. What we don't want to do is say, okay, uh, we're going to begin to make all this policy in the middle of a crisis that is there for Japan. We should ask well-informed questions. Do you think that the, that the nuclear industry is at threat right now where 20% of our electricity is from nuclear? Should it grow? or is it at threat because of this crisis? I don't think that it is at threat for any growth. I think that what we're going to see is a review 
and going back and dotting the I's, crossing the T's, checking to make certain that the processes that are in place in this country are going to be safe. As you say, we'll be watching those hearings. Thank you yes, so much, will. Congresswoman Blackburn. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Imagine all the lessons still to be learned about nuclear energy in its infancy back in 1957. That's when the country's first privately owned nuclear generator, a predecessor to the troubled facilities in Japan, went online in Northern California. Back then, of course, the headlines were much, much different, reflecting our fascination with the promise of boundless nuclear-generated electricity, as you'll see in this Energy Then. A new landmark rises at Pleasanton. It is the nation's first privately financed and operated atomic power plant. Leading figures in the atomic world are present for the inauguration ceremonies. Then a tour of the 5,000 kilowatt plant begins with entry of the airlock. Activity in the heavily shielded atomic pile is reflected on the scores of dials as power from a pioneer source begins to flood through the countryside. That facility was used as a testbed for the first large-scale GE reactors. Over six years of operation, it supplied as much power to the California grid as its modern successor can in less than two days. The reactor was closed in 1963, but the site remains an engineering landmark. Still ahead, nuclear designs of the future. Will smaller be safer? A new generation of reactors could fit in your backyard. Or imagine underwater nuclear reactors pumping power back on land. Those stories, when we come back. Even an Iraq vet like me who's in really good shape needs good health care. Especially when it's top quality and convenient. And it's not just for men. In fact, aren't you a vet, Patricia? Yeah, I served in the Air Force. So why not come in today? When you check in, you'll get a full medical exam, first thing. Free for vets at the VA. So check us out and see you here. Just a few days before the Japanese quake and nuclear crisis, a bipartisan group of U.S. Senators introduced legislation to direct the Department of Energy to develop innovative technology to build small nuclear reactors known as SMRs. The industry believes they are the next frontier in nuclear power. And the designers say, in light of the disaster in Japan, SMRs are even more appealing now and demand thorough consideration. More from Energy Now's Daniel Seberg in this Energy Next. Living in America, there's a decent chance your town is partly powered by a nuclear plant. But let's say your town is growing and the plant needs more power. One option in the future could be the utility adding a small modular reactor, or SMR. Think of it as a small nuclear plant, but with inherent differences. They're smaller and they're modular, so you can add more over time. Also, many use a different method for cooling, and they're meant to be underground. A few months ago, I visited New Scale Power's test facility in Corvallis, Oregon. Inside here is our reactor vessel. Scientists here have come up with one of the designs for an SMR. The hope is that it'll bring safe, clean, and cheap energy to homes across the country. Jose Reyes is the founder of NuScale. The concept is just a reactor inside of essentially a stainless steel thermos bottle, underwater, underground. And being underground is something one structural engineer finds encouraging. Bojidar Stoyadinovic has been studying the potential impact of earthquakes on small modular reactors. If a reactor, a small modular reactor, is under, completely underground during an earthquake, it will see somewhat less shaking than it would if it was on top of the, on top of the soil. And, you know, depending on how deep it goes, it will see less and less. It will, of course, see something. But, you know, when, something, well, when we put something underground, then we also have to make sure that the walls that are protecting or uh, the excavation are strong enough. The small reactors won't require as much space as conventional reactors, but that also means they'll be less powerful. What would be the output of one of these? It would be 45 megawatts electric net. So and that would what be would that power. power roughly? I mean. So that's about 45,000 homes. A far cry from the massive 1,000 plus megawatt plants we're used to today. And smaller can mean safer. Andy Kadak is a former professor of nuclear science at MIT. The worst case scenario for uh, most of these is going to be less damaging than a worst case scenario for a larger plant. 
He says many of the designs for the small reactors have a passive safety system that would kick in should an accident occur. The amount of heat generated in a small modular reactor is very small compared to a large reactor. And that heat can be transferred without any additional cooling directly to the reactor vessel, which is around the core, and then that vessel radiates heat to the building or the structure that's there. And that system alone is sufficient to keep the core from melting. And there are structural benefits beyond passive safety. They have less weight, therefore they're more conducive to a variety of structural engineering solutions uh, that uh, can make them even safer. One is putting them underground. The other one is installing what we call seismic isolation underneath them, such that the energy that the earthquake has is uh, attenuated in some sense. Another concern for nuclear power plants, terrorism. We have a big advantage because ours is a post 9-11 design. So we've taken some uh, very important measures up front because with a clean sheet of paper, you can, you can really do that. So uh, we've, we're doing all of our security analysis up front uh, to meet this, this, the latest uh, uh, terrorist type threat uh, uh, requirements. But what happened in Japan wasn't just an earthquake. It was an earthquake and a tsunami, and worse than what anyone could have imagined. So where would we be had it been an SMR instead of a traditional nuclear plant? We'd probably be in a better situation right now, largely because of the passivity of the, of the design, not because they're necessarily small or modular. It's the design that matters. If an SMR could avoid a disaster similar to what we're seeing in Japan, then maybe they're the future of the industry. Maybe. But the traditional questions of high cost and radioactive waste disposal still must be overcome. How far away is this from being a reality? You know, every day it just gets more and more real. Uh, certainly uh, we, what we're seeing is that there's more enthusiasm for the design. Uh, the regulators are, are, are now open and receptive to, to what we're sending them, which is very positive. Uh, they're very interested in what we're doing. If these designs are put forward and licensed by the regulator, I think the future is very bright. In Corvallis, Oregon, Daniel Seberg, Energy Now. France is a country that gets 80% of its electricity from nuclear power, and it's adding some depth to the SMR's design, literally. That's what's in this week's Energy Now Hot Zone. The idea is to use submarine technology to drop the modular reactor about two to 300 feet into offshore waters. This is animation of the Flex Blue unit by a French defense contractor. The company says underwater reactors will be less vulnerable to earthquakes or natural disasters. Buildings on shore would get the power via undersea cables. This particular design is at least two years from reality. And that is it for this week's Energy Now. If you want to weigh in on the future of nuclear energy in the United States, we have a poll on our website at energynow.com. If you have any questions for upcoming guests, please let us know. Upload your video questions or remarks to our YouTube channel, Energy Now News. Remember, give us your name and where you're from, and keep the remarks short, please, less than 30 seconds. You can also friend us on Facebook, join our discussion pages, or follow us on Twitter. Search them all at Energy Now News. I'm Thalia Shura. See you next week.